This is the video presentation for slow reading and big history, transcribing early modern texts and learning to map early modern minds. This paper tackles the issues of finding ways to encourage students to read slowly and carefully while also developing digital skills. We explain the process we developed for teaching both slow reading through transcription and distant analysis through the use of voyant tools. It's a collaborative paper that emerges out of work that two history professors and three teaching center colleagues at Brock University have done since 2014. Our common project has been the conceptualization, design, and teaching of Brock History Department's first and currently only fully online course offering. History 2F90 is called Money and Power in the Atlantic World. Of course, one of the themes that we have in the course is the theme of slavery. When we were preparing our lessons on slavery and the idea for the whole course we were pretty clear that we didn't want to simply reproduce a standard course in the digital environment. We wanted, in fact, to take advantage of the digital environment. But we also wanted to give students a chance, as best we could provide it to them, to work with original sources. Now, one of the big challenges in working with early sources, early modern sources or medieval sources, is that students often see them in prepared form. Here's an example from the American Yacht Reader. It, there's lots of printed versions like this too. One of the documents we assigned for students in one of our weeks was readings from uh, the Eliza Lucas letters. These are already transcribed, prepared for students, easy to read, useful for course use, but they give a sense of easy access to documents that for us as historians who are used to going to original sources in archives are, of course, we realize, illusory. One of our early thoughts about how to solve this problem of dealing with original texts was to go to the many texts that are available in archive.org in original photographic form. It's easily accessible, it allows us to work with really original documents, and in fact, for the students to work with original documents in ways that many historians, professional historians, have already not done. But we quickly ran into a problem, which we summarized in a blog post that we did in our, our teaching blog, Adventures in Teaching History Online. We call the blog post Holy Fit, uh, because, well, you'll see very quickly with this example from Wharton's essay on the genius of and writing of Pope, with an excerpt from Shakespeare's The Tempest, that texts that are in archive.org in their original page scans and are then scanned by optical character recognition programs turn early modern text, even quite straightforward early modern text like this excerpt from Temp The Tempest, into a, well, sometimes embarrassing and humorous hash. We were faced with a, a real challenge, which we decided to turn into, well, the centerpiece of our course and it, it get our students to help us solve. So what we did is we, first of all, found a series of five texts from 1780s. It was a time of parliamentary debates in London about the abolition of the English slave trade. That debate produced quite a lot of literature. Here's an example the abolitionist James Ramsey's objections to the abolition of the slave trade with answers, a pamphlet from 1788. What were our goals when we had students read texts like Ramsey's objections? Well, there were a few of them. We wanted to give them a sense, of course, of what actual early modern primary sources look like, and that meant that we had to get them to learn how to read the 18th century typography with its funny S's and F's. We wanted also to get them to learn how to transcribe texts, the dirty work, the hard work, the grunge work of historians who then want to work with digital sources. So all in all, we had five pamphlets from 1788 in which authors were debating the pros and cons of abolition. In total, it was about 300 pages of texts. And that presented us with a challenge for students. We wanted each student to transcribe 
two groups of five pages of text and then double check the work of other students, another five pages. And our hope was that students working collaboratively would be able to produce together a clean text, a, a, a plain digital text that could be machine readable. The third thing that we wanted was for students to be able to work with the output that they created from these five separate texts and particularly work with them in a digital reading tool, Boyant Tools, which we'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes. The course design that we decided on for the assignment flow was relatively complex. It had to be so to solve a whole series of problems. This workflow chart here, Slow Reading Early Modern Texts by Julia Forsyth, one of our team members, gives you a sense of the complexity of the whole process of preparing documents in, in their scanned form, preparing a transcription tool, and that leading through the process of reading that students did in their various assignments. One of the things that we had to learn as historians who tend to want to work as lone wolves is that we had to rely on teamwork. And we blogged about this in an entry, Teamwork and Humility, all the way from last May. Among the things that we had to do, we realized early on, is build a, a new transcription tool. We had looked for some, such as Scripto, which works well with WordPress, or something like the tool used by the Transcribe Project of the Library of Virginia, but none of them we could make work easily with our learning management system. At Brock, it's Sakai. Our solution to the problem was to develop our own transcription tool that worked in Sakai. It took a lot of meetings of the five of us, three from the Center for Pedagogical Innovation and two of us from the History Department. In the end, we came up with a plan that we thought would work, we were convinced would work, and our intrepid web developer guy, Mike Brasso, built an interface. This is a screenshot of it. Students, Each student got a, two tasks of transcribing five randomly assigned pages from this corpus of 300 pages, and then also each student had to double-check another five pages that students had previously transcribed and produce a final clean copy. This is what the interface looked like from a student point of view. No student names are here, but you'll see transcription A, B, the original text, and then a text that the student produced in the end. The module offers students the opportunity for slow reading, where they have a better opportunity to think about the foreignness of these very strange texts about the slave trade and the very strange world of slavery. The procedure, we hope, encourages them, them to think about sources and where they come from, how scholars do research, what methodologies historians employ, and also offer students new ways to think about reading itself. Later on in the course, after introducing students to a whole series of themes in the history of colonialism, slavery, and debates about its abolition, we got students to read the texts that they had transcribed in a number of different ways. Number one, in a traditional historian's way, reading the text closely and carefully and slowly, and then also using a digital reading tool created by a series of Canadian researchers, Voyant Tools. Here is an image of a pane that includes four of the, the five texts, all from 1788, summarized in a number of different ways, as a word cloud or cirrus, the texts themselves in a reader, a comparison of word trends, and so on. The point of this digital or distant reading was to encourage students to think about texts and the themes of the course in, well, new and curious ways. We wanted them really to think about questions and inferences that they could try to investigate with this type of a reading that they could then follow up on with close and careful 
slow reading, looking at the texts themselves carefully to see if they're inferences about all four of the texts or themes or concept clusters and so on actually made sense as they read the work of John Ramsey and others closely and carefully. Here's a simpler Voyant view. It's simpler because it's just a window of one tool, the bubble lines tool, and a, a view of the first four most common words across one text. John Ramsey's 1788 abolitionist text objections. Those first four most frequent terms are slaves, object, ants, well, I guess, and trade. One of the things that we would hope students would be able to do using the various tools in Voyant is look for patterns, think about evidence, and then develop some questions. And here one of the possibilities is to well, wonder what's going on with these two terms, object and answer. Students, if they would investigate, would find that there's a pattern in the text. Ramsey begins his objections with an introduction, which forms the first third of the text, and then a series of considerations of not objects, but objections and answers. In other words, two abbreviations. And the last two thirds of the text is a consideration of a whole series of these objections with answers to the abolition of the slave trade. And so that would be something that we would hope students would pay attention to, and some did, both in their digital reading and in their close reading. Here are a few concluding thoughts. We want our students to recognize rhetorical patterns and argumentative structures in texts, and we want to teach them how to do this. We realize that it's really difficult to learn to recognize these kinds of patterns and structures, especially for students who are not from backgrounds that cultivate humanist skills or encourage traditional reading habits. The Niagara region, where Brock University is located, has some of the highest unemployment rates and some of the lowest levels of post-secondary education in the country. So we feel a responsibility to look for creative and engaging ways to teach reading more effectively. Education theorists talk about threshold concepts in disciplines, that is, those ways of thinking and doing that once mastered transform the way a learner approaches fundamental issues. We have a sense that our technique is helping students in this way, 